pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We have a roll call, please. Jamie Girardi. Here. Peter Hansel. Here. Roberto Saez. Here. Christopher Poole. Here. Chris Williams. Here. And Chairman Charles Gray. Here. <clears throat> Do you want to uh, then read the proof of publication, please? The items were published in the Tampa Bay Times on January 27th, 2021, February 3rd, 2021, February 17th, 2021, February 21st, 2020, 20, well, 2021, and February 24th, 2021. All right, thank you very much. <clears throat> and I think we have minutes to approve. Do I hear a motion to approve the minutes of January 7th? February 4th and February 18th. Jamie Girard, so moved. Second, Chris Williams. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion on the motion? <clears throat> all, all in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. Roll call. Jamie Girardi. Aye. Peter Hansel. Aye. Roberto Saez. Aye. Christopher Pohl. Aye. Chris Williams. Aye. And Chairman Charles Gray. Hi, thank you. Okay, so for those uh, who have not attended the committee meeting before, uh, the Planning Commission is appointed by the Board of County Commissioners and we meet twice monthly. We serve as a local planning agency. And we hold public hearings and transmit to the Board of County Commissioners recommendations on comprehensive plan amendments, land development code amendments, rezonings and conditional use requests. Planning Commission is the final decision-making body for special exceptions, certain appeals, variance requests, and certain alternative standard requests. However, final decisions may be appealed to the Board of County Commissioners. If anyone is in opposition to any comprehensive plan amendment, land development code amendment, rezoning, conditional use, <clears throat> or any item where the Planning Commission transmits a recommendation to the Board of County Commissioners, it's important for you to attend the appropriate Board of Com County Commission meeting. <clears throat> and for those of you, again, who aren't familiar with the, the uh, how the meeting is run, we have uh, continuances. It's been our custom to uh, approve requests for continuance by the applicant or the staff, unless we have an extenuating circumstances. We have a consent. Uh, section where items are, have been applied for and there's been no opposition by the staff or by the public. We'll go through those one at a time and if anything, whatever remains on consent will stay on consent and will be voted on at one time. And if you, if the public here, somebody in the staff, here's something that needs to be pulled from consent, just uh, notify me, raise your hand or speak and we'll pull it for discussion and it'll go on to the regular items. And those are the items not placed on consent or asked for continuance. Applicants will have three minutes to make a presentation and the respondents will have uh, three minutes to state their concerns. And then the applicant will have some time to uh, respond to those concerns. <clears throat> um, if there has been a request at least 24 hours before this meeting in writing for additional time to speak, um, it may be granted, and I think we have two requests. Uh, Denise, is that right? Two, two requests? Yes, yes Mr. Chairman, and, Denise uh, Hernandez, you do have two requests. Both, those have both been granted. And, uh, but before we get started, uh, this is the segment for, uh, for the public hearing. If there are any items that we wish to have uh, somebody speak on that are not on the on the agenda itself this is the time for that person to speak i believe we have one speaker is that right is that speaker yes present? mr chairman we have uh sheriff Nako on on to speak i'm sorry 
Say that again, Denise. We have Sheriff Nako is on who will be speaking. He is, okay. All right, Sheriff, welcome. I uh, appreciate it. Thanks, Mr. Chairman, and thanks everybody on the board. Um, just want to touch base and let you know, you know why I want to speak today is to explain the process, how we want to be involved, and you know, talking to our county commissioners, you know, about the important role you all play and how the sheriff's office can be incorporated into it. And so, you know, we're very fortunate that Commissioner Moore uh, brought it up, and but with Commissioner Starkey, in her wisdom, you know, was asking that we be on the pre-app review process, which we are. Um, you know, we look forward to working with Denise, Sally, and David, and everybody. So the you know, good background, you know, as we're blessed the past was growing our concern is you know that the sheriff's office has a role because we think there's a if we can get on the beginning of the process we're much better off five ten fifteen is down the road. so when the commercial property come in the commercial property has been fantastic we don't really have much of a concern because there isn't uh too many law enforcement issues that are associated with it but when residential properties are coming in our you know there's things that we could have done years ago you know, we wouldn't be in a situation where now, and so what we ask is, you know, being part of this process, we can, you know, provide some insight, you know, and big one is traffic calming. You know, traffic calming devices in when residential properties being developed or using some other uh, security through environmental protection, you know, that will stay in the long run. So that's why we're going to be engaged in this process. Uh, we know that you know right now there's discussion about two or a couple very large developments coming in on state road 52 uh, by our you know that's what we want to be involved in the process as that is moving forward because those residents play a huge component to it and i i don't want to speak on behalf of fire rescue but i know where the fire trucks are. i just saw a couple of fire trucks going i know they pull fire trucks from across the county well you know the sheriff's office the residential properties are the same way they use a lot of resources um, so that's why, as we're planning, as we're developing them, I just want to put that on the radar that you know, approving and as you go through the residential process for property, the law enforcement safety component should be a huge part because what we don't want is communities that are developed and look great but aren't as safe as they could for the future cause issues. So, again, I want to put the board as a couple of the developments are coming on board as we're seeing on State Route 52 or anywhere in the community, just set in mind that uh, the sheriff's office, we want to be involved now because we want to keep those guys now in the future, and we don't want them to decrease after everybody's done a hard job and a great job trying to get them here. So thank you all very much. Thank you, Sheriff. Um, do we need to take any action with regard to this, or, or is this going to come before us again in a more official form? No, no action is, is to be taken. I think the sheriff's intent, and, and please, um, Sheriff Knuckle, was just to provide clarification to the planning commission. Okay. All right. Very good, Sheriff. Those are some good ideas. So uh, hopefully we can get those worked out. The communication, I think his mic is off again. Sheriff, I think your oh, mic is off. Back. Can you hear me? Your mic was off. Can you could you hear yeah, me can now? Can you hear me? Now yes, I, I can. Yeah. yeah. It was like a commercial. Yeah. Uh, again, yes, exactly. Like you just heard. That. It's just for clarification. Yeah. I, there. You, your mic is breaking up, which is making it difficult for uh, for us to hear oh. everything you're saying. I think there's a conspiracy oh. going on here. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Sheriff. Appreciate okay. it. Thank you. Okay. Okay, we're good, I guess. We're so uh anybody have any questions about that or concerns? No. Okay. Well, where are we with the process? I had heard that the uh county commissioners had uh, tabled it for a short period of time. Has this moved forward? In the process of bringing a deputy or a person from the sheriff's office on board. Denise, can you want to speak yeah, to that? Sure, absolutely. David? Yes, I can. I can speak to that in the best of possibly the best way I possibly can, and uh, perhaps my colleagues can jump in if that's okay. So basically, what was determined at that board meeting is that there will not be a deputy on the planning commission, but that from that moment moving forward, the sheriff's office would be fully involved in pre-application meetings and also all 
applications for development would be sent directly to the sheriff's office. And we did find a, uh, a representative in, um, in Captain Sanborn. So uh, Captain Sanborn is going to um, receive all the applications for development activity. And uh, Captain Sanborn is also going to receive all the requests for pre application meetings. And what he would do in turn is that he would review them and do a triage and determine whether um, it is a application that the sheriff's office wants to sit through the pre-application meeting on. Okay, well, that's good. That'll, that'll be a good way to get them involved then. Great. That answer your question, Pete? Well, no, not really. Okay. <laughs> I, had, I had proposed this many years ago, this concept of having some of the sheriff's department a law enforcement person on the board when we're the old board, not the current process we're in now. I, th I personally think the idea has merit. We have a school board official here that we can turn to and ask him specific questions that are related to development within the community, within the county, regarding schools. And I think having a law enforcement officer uh, has this very positive aspect because you can turn to him and say, hey, look, there's going to be a housing development here. There's going to be a certain kind of business going in this location. You know, what is the statistical analysis that's that the Department of Justice sends out a very thick booklet on crime within communities? And based on the information that they have, that is the sheriff's office, based on information they get from the Department of Justice, they can feed us or guide us into a particular area. For instance, apartment complexes, which I which I brought up some time back. There's a tendency for certain crimes to be committed. I, I know I'm taking too much time and I'll be brief now, but I think that they have the ability to provide us and guide us with some type of uh, uh, concepts on what may occur within a, a development of some type, whether it's housing, commercial, or uh, uh, I don't wanna say of uh, high density. That's where I'm trying to find high density. That's all I'm saying. So I think the idea has merit to have somebody like we do with the school board. And so that's that's my opinion on it. And that was presented to the Board of County Commissioners and the Board of County Commissioners did not vote to, to do that. I understand, but. Uh, yeah, but <clears throat> what you did do was you decided to bring them in on the early stages uh, where you can actually sit down and and discuss it with them during the application process, right? And they'll have input. That's so accurate. It, yes, correct. In, in some ways, they'd actually have more input using that method than they would if they were just on this board and didn't have any other involvement. So, you know, I think uh, what your concerns are, Pete, I think are good ones. And I think maybe they are have been addressed because they just did it a little different way. So, so but uh, yeah, good questions. Good questions. Thanks, Denise. Anybody else have any questions? No, if not, we'll move on then. Okay, we are you presenting, Denise? Yes, I am. I'm here. You're stuck with me. Okay. Well, I'm happy about that. <laughs> well, I am glad. Let me let me know if, when you want me to start. All right. I'm ready anytime you are. Great. So uh, first, we're going to go over a walk on item. This is the reason this is a, a walk on item. This is an item that was advertised for, for today's public hearing. And it is basically um, and I sent it to the planning commission members through email earlier today. And I also copied the clerk and some other folks. Uh, the item is PDD 210267. And it's an ordinance amending the Pasco County Land Development Code in order to restate reorganize and amend chapter 500. Um, we realize that we really need to involve um, some other stakeholders a little bit further in the process. So at this point in time, the item is being withdrawn from the agenda. There is no um, action required. You may want to ask uh, for public comment. Um, however, from what I see, there is no one that has signed up for this item um, or sent any comments on the item. But at this moment, it's being withdrawn from consideration. Um, and you will see this in some future agenda. All right, thank you. So Terry's off the hook, is that what you're saying? <laughs> He'll be on the hook later on for some other good stuff. Oh, okay. 
Okay. All right, next. Okay, the next item is PDD 2175.09. It is a rezoning request from an MPUD master plan unit development district to an MPUD master plan unit development in order to allow the applicant to assign entitlements to the Connerton Village 2 and 4 MPUD. This item comes to you with a request for a continuance to the March 25th, 2021 Planning Commission meeting at 1.30 in Newport Ritchie. Okay, and the applicant uh, here, and are they in agreement? The applicant is virtually present and the applicant is in agreement. And we don't have anyone signed up to speak on this item. We did, uh, but the person decided because it was gonna be a continuance item that he would um, show up at the following planning commission meeting when it would be heard. Okay, all right. So we have a request for continuance and there are no objections. Can I hear a motion? Move to continue to March 25th. Second, Chris Poole. Okay. Chris Williams uh, made the motion. Chris Poole second. Uh, all in favor of the motion signify by saying aye by roll call. Jamie Girardi. Aye. Peter Hansel. Aye. Roberto Saez. Aye. Christopher Poole. Chris Williams. Aye. And Chairman Charles Gray. Aye. Okay. Okay, the following item is PC2, PDD 210290. It's a comprehensive plan amendment, CPAL 2014 for Central Pasco Employment Village. It's a comprehensive plan text amendment to the Central Pasco Employment Village, sub area policies, policy future land use 7.1.12. And this comes to you with a re uh, recommendation for continuance to the March 25th, 2021. Uh, local planning agency meeting at 1.30 in Newport Ritchie. Okay, and the applicant present. Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman, Joel, two, two and associates for the applicant. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you, Joel. Uh, you have any objection to the continuance? No, sir, provided that the continuance is just to the March 25th meeting, the applicant has agreed to the continuance. Okay, and is there anyone here to speak against? We don't have anyone um, signed up to speak, nor have we received any emails, and no one is at the kiosk. Okay, thank you. So we have no objection, request for continuance. Do I have a motion? Jamie Girardi, I'll move for continuance to the March 25th meeting. Peter Hansel, I'll second that motion. Okay. Any further discussion? If not, all in favor, signify by saying aye. Roll call. Jamie Girardi. Aye. Peter Hansel. Aye. Roberto Saez. Aye. Christopher Pohl. Aye. Chris Williams. Aye. And Chairman Charles Gray. Aye. Thank you. Okay. okay. The following item is PDD 217515. It's a zoning amendment in the names of Terry and Tina Gillette. It's for a change in zoning from an AC agricultural district to an AR5 agricultural residential district and an AR5MH agricultural mobile home district. What's being proposed is that on one half of the parcel, it's going to be for a site built home and on the other half, it's for a mobile home. Uh, it comes to you with a recommendation of approval. The applicant is virtually present. Okay, and is there anyone here to object? We have no one signed up to speak, no one at the kiosk, and no letters to read into record of objection. Okay, then we'll leave that one on consent. Go to the next one. Following item is PD 217525. It's a zoning amendment um, under the names of the Southwest Florida Water Management District, Cypress Ridge Professional Center. It's for a change in zoning from AC Agricultural District to a PO2 Professional Office District. Um, comes to you with a recommendation of approval. Okay, and that's on consent. And uh, is there the applicant present? The applicant is virtually present. Okay, and any objections? We have no one signed up to speak to object. We have not received any emails, nor is there anyone at the kiosk. Okay. 
I'm going to leave that one on consent. Go to the next one. The following one, Mr. Chair, is PDD 217521. It's a zoning amendment in the name of Robert Wendell Pippin, Jr. and Clay Tanner Pippin. It's for a change in zoning from AC Agricultural District to an AR Agricultural Residential District. Comes to you with a recommendation of approval. And the applicant is virtually present. All right. And anyone here to object? We have no one signed up to speak um, on this item, nor have we received any emails, nor is there anyone at the kiosk. All right. So that one will remain on consent. Yes, Mr. Chair. Do you want me to go on to the following item? Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Please. Oh, thank you, sir. Um, the following item is just a moment. It's um, left my screen, which is absolutely fabulous. Technology is great. The following item is PDD 210211. It's a comprehensive plan amendment, small scale, CPAS 2003 for Old Lakeland Highway. It's a small scale comprehensive plan amendment to the future land use maps 2-15 and sheet 16. It's changing it from res one, residential one dwelling unit per acre to IL, industrial light, on uh, five acres that are located on the northwest corner of Townsend Road and Old Lakeland Highway. Um, you're sitting as a local planning agency on this item. And uh, we're asking that you that you find it consistent with the Co Pasco County Comprehensive Plan, and that you recommend approval to the Board of County Commissioners. Okay. Anyone to speak on the item? We have uh, no one to speak. The applicant is virtually present. If you have any questions, and we have no one signed up at the, at the kiosk to speak on the item. Okay. If uh, the app applicant has no one to speak, or not, no one wants to speak, or we'll, we'll remain on consent. And go to the okay. next item. The following item is uh, the companion rezoning on this item, PDD 217514 in the name of BMI LLC. It's for a change in zoning from AR Agricultural Residential District to an I-1 Light Industrial Park District. Comes to you with a recommendation of approval. The applicant is virtually present. All right. And is there anyone here to object? We have no one that has signed up to speak, nor is there anyone at the kiosk, nor have we received any emails to read into record. Okay, and <clears throat> anything from the da dais here? If not, uh, that will remain on consent. And that okay, concludes so your consent agenda. Okay, so we, uh, <clears throat> we've heard all the items on consent. Do I hear a motion to approve uh, the consent ag agenda as submitted? So moved, Chris Poole. Jamie Girardi, second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any further discussion of the motion? All in favor of the motion signify by saying aye and by roll call. Jamie Girardi? Aye. Peter Hansel? Aye. Roberto Saez? Aye. Christopher Poole? Aye. Chris Williams? Aye. And Chairman Charles Gray? Hi. Okay, we're ready for the next okay. one. Thank you. So I think we're going to ask a couple of questions on this one. Um, on this particular next item, um, we've got items P8 and P P9. P8 is the comprehensive plan amendment, and P9 is the companion rezoning. We do have several folks that have signed up to speak on both items. Um, we mm -hmm. also have an email. Um, of objection to be read. It's three pages. So when I start reading it, I'm going to ask that I be timed on that. So just wanted to ask the chair and uh, the planning commission members, uh, what's how, how do you want to handle the item? Okay. Well, the applicant's present, correct? Right. The applicant yeah. is virtually present. We do have uh, two objectors um at, at the uh, kiosk as far as i can i can tell um i will double check for that as well um and we do have an email to be read into record and we have several folks who are on webex to speak um in opposition to the item also okay um <clears throat> this applicant has not requested extra time is that correct the, the applicant has requested extra time. Um, Ms. Wilhite has been granted 15 minutes of time. 
and uh, Mr. Press, Pressman has been uh, has asked for 12 minutes of time, and that has been granted as well. Okay. So, Denise, uh, Mr. Chair, yes, I want to make sure Denise's question was answered. Are you asking whether the planning committee to open up the public hearing for both items at the same time? Is that what you're asking, the chair? Yes, David. That's what I'm asking. I, I don't. I don't know if we should like ask for objections on P8 and ask for objections on P9 because they're basically the same objection. Does, does the applicant have any objection to us opening up the public hearings at the same time? The applicant does not. I think that's a better way to handle it, to do the public hearing, to combine the public hearing for both items. So that would be the pleasure of the chair if he wants to, if he's okay with that. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it makes sense to to deal with both of them since they're related um, at the same time if we can. Um, so my question about time is, uh, do, would Barbara uh, want to reserve her time to respond to the people that are going to speak against it or have questions? Or would you like to make some comments to begin? So, Mr. Chairman, that's a very good question. Uh, this is Barbara Wilhite. I think... Your staff, both you have two staff members. You have Amy Heiler and Christina Acosta, and they have their presentations. I think the, the best way to order this would be allow them to each do their presentations, one on the comp plan, one on the zoning, and then opening that up for public comment, and then I can present um, in rebuttal. My presentation is combined as well. It's just one presentation that addresses both land use and zoning. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. All right. So, Amy. Mr. Chairman? Yes. Uh, sir, my name is Todd Pressman. I'm representing residents and neighbors in the area. Um, we would much prefer to hear what the applicant is presenting. The residents need to be fully up to speed. And with all due respect, that is the normal, typical manner in which the applicant then has a chance to rebut. So I'm sorry, but we're, we're, the applicant has an opportunity to choose when they like to speak. And that's our That's been our tradition, so that's where we're going with it. So uh, you must already have in mind what you have objections to. So um, there's really no reason to go over that again. So we'll we'll give you all your time to speak and ask questions. And then Ms. Wilhite will have an opportunity to uh, respond to each and every one of your questions. We appreciate your consideration. Thank you. Thank you. Amy. Hello. Hi, Amy Heiler here with uh, Planning and Development. And once the slide starts, I can get started. Who's following you, Amy? I didn't get the. What is it? Who do they say was going to follow you? Christina Costa. Oh, okay. Christina Costa. Okay, I was sharing my screen, so let me try again. I, I'm. I know there's a delay, but let me let me try again. Yeah, we do see the PowerPoint. You do. Okay. Like All right. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Do you have what you need, Amy, or you can't see the screen? I can see the slides. We can use this, but it hasn't like officially started. So it's just the normal PowerPoint program. Yeah, we're just seeing the cover sheet. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah, when so. you press that button on the bottom, it didn't pop up as the PowerPoint. So okay. we're still looking at the slides. While we're waiting, can I just swear everybody in who plans on speaking? Sure, that's a great okay. idea. Okay. If you plan on speaking on the items today, could you please raise your right hand? Do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give is a truth to help you, God? Just say yes. Uh, yes. Thank you. Okay, so it looks like you're seeing just individual slides for whatever reason. I'm not sure yeah. why. You're seeing it like that. Um, let me do. It just moves on. To, can you see it now? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Fabulous. All right. So now I'm going to probably have to go through the entire thing to get to where you need to be.
All right. Is this okay. where you want to be? Fabulous. Yes, thank you very much. Um, okay, so item uh, P8 is going to be CPAS 2002 in the name of Meadowbrook. You can uh, slide. It's uh, item PDD 21-0225. It is a small-scale comprehensive plan amendment. Slide. The proposal for this small-scale comprehensive plan amendment is to amend the future land use maps 2-15 and sheet 20 from res 3 residential three dwelling units per gross acre to calm commercial it is located at the southwest corner of the of state road 54 in meadowbrook drive and the amendment or to this the resolution to this proposal is as stated follows uh, amend the future land use map 2-15 and sheet 20. there is an accompanying rezoning to c2 commercial district that will follow up this presentation. Um, so the comprehensive plan consistency, uh, these are the following policies that the proposed amendment is consistent with. I do want to go um, through them in detail. So policy flu 162 location for commercial development, uh, how the comprehensive plan states, it says Pasco County may allow comprehensive plan amendments to calm commercial future land use designation only under fo the following conditions. And so there's three conditions in this set that the, that the uh, proposed amendment must meet to allow for a commercial development or an amendment to calm. So in this case, the first uh, condition states that it must be located at an existing collector and arterial roadway. State Road 54 is an arterial roadway and Meadowbrook Drive is the intersection that is going to be your uh, county collector roadway. And so after through some of the uh, conversations and research that we had, just to be clear, intersection is as stated. Um, I confirmed with FDOT on how they define intersection as well, and it's in essence an intersection. Any types of roadway that do intersect, bisect, um, it's not necessarily county collector arterial. It actually just has to have that intersection, and I do have the definition if necessary. Um, oh, I have it right here, actually. So how FDOT defines it is uh, multiple different ways. It says an at-grade connection or crossing of a local road or state highway with a state highway. So local road being the southern portion of Meadowbrook and State Road 54 being your arterial or state highway. Um, then there's also a conventional quote at grade intersection being three legs, four legs or multi legs. In this case, we have four legs. And then also the third um, definition is areas that include not only the physical area where the roadways cross each other, but also the area upstream or downstream of physical interaction, meaning where the driver interacts with that intersection. So with that being said, based on that definition and the arterial and collector status of Me Meadowbrook Drive and State Road 54, it meets that condition. The second condition states that it may not detract or it shall not detract from existing TC town center. So what this means is actually our town center flu designation. We have a town center flu designation out by Curly Road. That's the only one that's existing right now. So in this case, it does not detract from our TC town center flu designation. And then the third one is it shall not uh, proliferate strip commercial development. In this case, it's at the southwest corner of Meadowbrook Drive and State Road 54. It won't proliferate strip commercial because it is uh, to the to the south of it. There's like a little canal or a hydrological feature, so it won't end up going strip southern. And to the um, uh, east, it's going to. Uh, I'm sorry. To the east, it's Meadowbrook Drive. So Meadowbrook Drive, it cannot extend past Meadowbrook Drive because of the roadway segment, so it won't proliferate strict, strict commercial there. And to the east, there's only about three properties um, that are adjacent to this property along State Road 54, and then you have your storage unit and wetlands, and it's a Category 1 wetland, so you can't develop past that as well, so it will not proliferate strip commercial. So in its simplistic form, with that one policy that allows for an amendment to calm, it meets those three criteria, which is why we're, we're moving forward th with this. Um, with the other policies, the next side you'll see the transitional land use 
policy flu 143 um, provides us with the foundation to address proposed comprehensive plan amendments and identify whether it would be considered a suitable transitional land use adjacent to following other transitional or other land uses that are existing. And so in this case, the abutting, res the abutting land use would be considered residential three or res three. The proposed amendment would be calm. As you see, there is a plus sign in this table, which basically means it can be a compatible transitional land Land use, but it does have to have sensitive site design, so in additional buffering and whatnot. Um, and then, in uh, uh, as a companion to this policy, we also have policy 144, which establishes the buffering requirements for residential pro residential properties. And in this case, it directs the LDC to establish those uh, adequate buffering standards. And so, adequate buffering standards will be provided on this site given the LDC um, code. So, slide please. And then these are gonna be some of your visuals. So as you see, it's located in the South Market area and urban service area, slide. And it is at the Southwest corner of Meadowbrook Drive and State Road 54 is highlighted, slide. Its existing uh, zoning is AR agricultural residential or AR1 agricultural residential. It is being uh, proposed to rezone to C2 a general commercial, which you'll be hearing that next slide. And the existing future land use, as you see, is Res 3, um, and the proposed amendment is to Com Commercial. Slide. And with that, we do recommend that the local planning agency find this amendment consistent with the policies identified in the comprehensive plan and approved to the Board of County Commissioners. Thank if you. If you have any questions, uh, anybody have any answer. questions? Go ahead, Chris. Amy, is the, uh, the, the two parcels immediately to the west, are those residences? Currently, one's a resident that's for sale, um, and then the one next to it is a resident that is active, and then the one right next to it is an office. It's already zoned PO1 office. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. The And I have a question, Amy, that sure. the <clears throat> thing that looks a little bit like a road, is that just an easement behind the property? The, the diagonal portion diagonal, south, that's yeah. actually like your canal or, or hydrological oh, that's feature the that's there. Okay. Gotcha. Okay. Any other questions from anybody? <clears throat> and I guess not. Thank you, Amy. You're welcome. Okay, who do we have next? Mr. Chair, did you want us to do the presentation for the following item? Is that what you want us to do? Yes. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon, this is Christina Acosta with Planning and Development Current Planning. This is the companion rezoning to the CPAL that Amy just presented. It's PDD 21-7516 in the name of Kitty Campus University, Inc. The request is for change in zoning from AR1, Agricultural Residential District, to a C2, General Commercial District. The property is located on the southwest corner of the intersection of State Road 54 and Meadowbrook Drive. The site is currently undeveloped and contains approximately 1.67 acres. The applicant proposes to develop the site in conformance with the C2 General Commercial District Standards for Development. The site has been reviewed by the Long Range Planning Division and was found to meet the location criteria of Comprehensive Plan Policy FLU 1.6.2 for commercial development because of its location at an intersection of an existing arterial roadway, State Road 54, and an existing collector roadway, Meadowbrook Drive. A comprehensive plan exhibit 2-2, traditional land uses, general guidelines, states that the commercial uses are appropriate near residential areas with special consideration to buffering and screening. Pursuant to flu 1.4.4, residential compatibility, buffering standards between residential and non-residential land uses. At the time of site plan review, the site will be subject to additional screening and buffering conditions exceeding the minimum requirements of the land development code. On March 23rd, uh, 2021, the Board of County Commissioners will consider comprehensive plan amendment CPAS 2002, amending the future land use of the subject site from Res 3, uh, residential three dwelling units per acre to calm commercial. 
If the subject of zoning is approved, it shall not take effect until the companion C pass is adopted by the BCC and the appeal period has ended. And this is just a visual showing the surrounding zoning. Um, it is all the adjacent neighbors are, are uh, zoned ER1. And then on the north side of State Road 54, you have an MPUD, which is um, entitled for a multifamily development. And then two lots to the west, you have a prof professional office. And as Amy pointed out, there is a, a, a water feature, a canal located adjacent to the south of the property. And the, the next slide is gonna show the current future land use, which is res three, but as, as we know, uh, we're the companion rezoning or the companion C pass would change this um, future land use to calm. And the last okay. slide is showing your access from State Road 54 and Meadowbrook Drive. And this is gonna come to you with a recommendation of approval from the Planning and Development Department. Thank you, I'm here for any questions. Okay, Chris, can, uh, I have a question, anybody else? It, got a quick question. Go ahead, Chris. So, Christine, could you speak to the buffering requirements that you mentioned a little bit? That was my question. A little question. bit more detail <laughs> for the residential properties? So the, the additional buffering requirements would be at the consideration of the, uh, the person who's charged with reviewing the site plan. So we, we don't have a site plan at this time, so we, we can't put, and it's also a Euclidean rezoning, so we can't put any specific uh, conditions on there. But they, they would be required to do whatever the, uh, the site reviewer felt was appropriate for the site based on the adjacent residential neighbors. Okay, and is that that is that handled at a public meeting or is that is that a, a conference, you know, separate conference? That those decisions. So the site plan review would not come to the planning commission or the board. Okay. Can you go back to that intersection photo, please? You had a photo of the intersection, like the last one you had up. It's not a, that's a four-way intersection I can see. Is there a signal light there? There is a signal. Thank you. Okay. Anything Christine, I, I guess going back to the buffering, I mean, isn't isn't the buffering <laughs> outlined in the land development code under section? Yes, there is buffering out, outlined in the land development code, but uh, based on the uh, compatibility requirements of the flu, it would be subject to additional buffering at the discretion of the of the site plan reviewer. So I can tell you what the minimum requirements would be. They would be over and above that. And as we saw to the south, there's um, there's the, the natural water buffering as well. Okay, so a residential to a, a C2 would require a, uh, a 10 foot wide buffer, single row of trees, maximum 60 feet, continuous row of evergreen shrubs, and no more than 30% of the landscaping could be grassed. And then uh, in addition to that, there are specific restrictions to how far a structure or a driveway could be located to a residential lot. Okay, any other questions? Okay, hearing none, thank you, Chris. Appreciate that. And if we can now uh, hear from the members of the public. Mr. Chair, how would you like to handle this? Um, I, we do have a letter to be read into record. Do you wanna start with that or how, how would you like to um, approach that? Yeah, we could start with, we could start with that. Um, <laughs> So we need to let you know when three minutes is up. <laughs> yes, um, let me first start by saying, if you want me to read the letter, um, let me just first start, it, state who it's from, and then we can start the, um, the clock, if that's all right. Okay, thank you. Okay, so um, the letter I'm going to be reading into record is from a gentleman by the name of Doug, W. Douglas Grant. He is a Meadowbrook Estates resident who resides at 2235 Brookside Drive, Lutes, Florida, 33558. And I will start reading the letter now. 
It states, I oppose rezo rezoning the two parcels, subject parcels at the southwest corner of State Road 54 and Meadowbrook Drive, Lutes, Florida from agricultural residential to C2. The following describes my understanding of the current circumstances in opposition to rezoning. Understanding of the circumstances. The subject parcels 29-26-18-0010-50-0582-0053-0053-0053-0053-0053-0053-0053-0053-0053-0053-0053-0053-0053-0053-0053-0053-0053-0053-0053-0053-0053-0053-0053-0053-0053-0053-0053-0053-0053
Todd, give me a second. I'm having some difficulties. Just a moment. No, no. Take your time, Denise. No pressure. Thank you. Do you want to try next slide, Denise, if you can, please? Are you seeing the slide that says that says site? Is that is that not the slide you're seeing? I'm seeing. Yes, I'm seeing. If we can move on to the next one, please. Okay. So you should now see a slide that says residential homes, residential homes. Is that what you're seeing? No, no, it's the same slide, unfortunately. Okay, a little closer view of this, I, that, that's fine, we can stop there. So to drive this point home, the site is indicated in yellow, is surrounded by residential homes. Next slide, please. And as a report notes, Zoning is primarily AR1, which is low density. Next slide, please. The future land use category is primary res three. You can see the entire area is res three is residential. Next slide, please. The zoning staff notes the surrounding area is characterized as residential development. That's very clear. Next slide, please. R3, the residential, the intent of R3 is to recognize those areas suited for single family detached residential development, which this entire area is. Next slide, please. Let's talk about past land use activity, which has not been raised. Next slide, please. A request came through for this property for a daycare and preschool in January 11. That was denied 7 0 by this board. Next slide, please. The same request came through one year later for daycare and preschool, and that was denied. So, Mr. Chairman, board members, this board, some of you may have been members at that time, this property was denied for a use that is far less impacting than what you're considering today. Mr. Chairman, board members, this request could allow a gas station operating on this property in this residential area. That would be nothing less than devastating to this community and this residential area. Next slide, please. Let's look at impacts. Next slide, please. Be aware that this is the Meadowbrooks Estates plat. This location, both of these parcels, is inside and part of this plat and part of the subdivision. Next slide. Please. Access is right in, right out on State Road 40, but they will have they're proposing a full access on Meadowbrook Drive. And their submittal notes the study assumes a reasonable access plan on the right end only State Road 54 and full access on Muddlebrook. That would be a tremendous confusion and impact of vehicles involved with all C2 activities. Next slide, please. Policy of Future Land Use 1.6.4 Neighbor Commercial Uses shall permit small scale neighborhood commercials only in areas permitted for commercial development. Note number two, new neighborhood commercial uses shall not be located internally within existing single family neighborhoods. And this commercial zoning proposed is located internal. Next slide, please. Per their own numbers, they're looking at almost 2,500 daily trips, 165 in the peak hour AM and 208 in the PM, coming in both uh, involved with both those access points. Next slide, please. Problematic uses involved, I told you already, is gasoline station. I believe that would include car washing, automobile washing, body and painting, barbecue stands, amusement facilities, contractor's office, dancing halls. Next slide, please. A long list of really problematic, upsetting, impacting, and uses that Next slide, please. We hired uh, Patricia Artiz. Um, that report is in your files. We submitted that early along with her resume. We had her look at this request. She is an AICP planner, and she made some conclusions for us, which we want you to know. Number one is that the zoning designation and long established, long established residential neighborhood character make these subdivisions unique. 
These plants were created in the early 1970s, while most of the surrounding development occurred in the late 1990s, early 2000s. Next slide, please. Looking at transitional land uses, she notes the commercial land use and zoning reclassification proposed does not provide a transition of use between the existing and well-established residential neighborhood. Mr. Chairman, I've been to the site. This hydrological condition is my car, a three or four foot wide little creek. Uh, as I served on Swift Mud for eight years, one year as chairman, I would hardly call this any kind of substantial hydrologic feature. And quite frankly, it provides more area that's open that does not provide a buffer for noise, light, or impacts of any kind. And for the staff to use that as a buffering element, we think is wrong in all respects. Our planner also tells you that the residents and habitability and buffer stamps between residential and non-residential uses shall protect these uses. But we just found out today that we will not even have input or any kind of review or consideration for the buffering or any kind of CT use. Next slide, please. Uh, our planner, private planner, also notes that commercial zoning is proposed to be located in terms of to the neighborhood, which I told you. Allowing the zoning will set a precedent for future commercialization of properties with frontage along 54 and within the Meadowbrook Estates neighborhood. Next slide. We also reached out to a real estate expert, which is also in your file. Uh, that is Mr. Rene Carpina of Florida's First Choice Realty. He is a broker and founder of the company. He has determined that the approved applications will be a negative impact on surrounding residential value, property values and will be much more impacting on those in the immediate area. Next slide, please. He indicates there is no question in his mind that home values will be negatively affected and some negative, seriously negative impacted by incompatibility, impacts and inconsistency, and the loss of residential and suburban harmony. Next slide, please. Planner's private conclusions that it is not consistent, it is in conflict with policies, and it is, it is incompatible with the surrounding residential designations. Next slide, please. And also notes that this change has potential to be inconsistent, incompatible with the neighboring residential designated land uses as well, and would create would result in the creation of an isolated district. I think that's pretty clear from the land use maps and the zoning maps. Next slide, please. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, I'm sorry. Hold on to that. This is important. Neighborhood commercial uses under this policy shall be located at collector arterial with preference given the locations at intersections. The subject property is not located at uh, an intersection and is proposed to be located internal to the neighborhood. Next slide, please. And next slide after that. So, Mr. Chairman, next slide, please. There you go. Mr. Chairman, these are the closely located abutting and near adjacent owners. These are all owners who are opposed and are on petitions that have been submitted to the county. Beyond that, we have submitted almost 140 petition signatures of residents in the immediate area who are absolutely positively against this application. And I have more to submit in the record today, which will take it to 140. Next slide, please. So in summary, the future, the future land use categories and zoning categories are all residential in the immediate area. There have been repeated and much lesser land use applications that have passed that have been firmly denied by this board. There will clearly be significant and tremendous impacts in the residential subdivision under a wide ranging C2 uses. We have policies and planners, private planners, conclusions of incompatibility and inconsistency, and there's tremendous neighborhood opposition. And I'd like to mention, Mr. Chairman, board members, it was very, very difficult for residents to be involved with this hearing today, to be involved virtually, or to be out here today. There was confusion where people were to go and how to sign up. But luckily, we were able to get that in writing for you. We appreciate your uh, allowance to put a little bit more on this request, and we're happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, so before you step away, are there any questions from the dais or, or anybody on uh, on the web? Mr. Pressman, I have one question. I think in your presentation, you made a comment or there was a point made in your presentation that said this property is not located at the intersection of a collector and an, ar and an arterial. I, I that think that was an error. That was an error, sir. I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah. That Very was good. an error. 
Okay, anybody else? Roberto, anything from you? No, sir. Okay. No. All right. Do we have Thank any? You. Who's next to speak? Thank you very much. State your name and address for the record. My name is Nadine Ferguson. I'm at 17550. Oh, sorry. My hearing's caught. So sorry. My name is Nadine Ferguson. I'm at 17550 Cedarwood Loop, Florida, 33558. I'm going to just speak to you since Mr. Pressman covered, I think, all the legal reasons is completely wrong. I will speak as a resident and the impact to my life. Um, I don't think you all can understand by looking at the aerial shots and the pictures how very small Meadowbrook Drive is. It represents the only in and out for many of us into that neighborhood. And I will say that this board before, when we came before them looking for help with flooding issues, with traffic issues, we were told. It's not a county maintained road. We did privately pay that. I paid for that. So I do not know how then we can call this a public road all of a sudden when businesses want to access it. Now, to the buyers of those properties, I welcome them to our neighborhood. But if you bought that as is, it was bought as agricultural, it's still agricultural. You should not have expected to be able to drop this in essentially what is my driveway. And I will say this again, gentlemen, that road is about the size of a large driveway. I wish you could really see it. Um, the buffer that they're talking about, the stream, I have hopped over it. It's that small. It is not a stream. It's not a big buffer. It is a small little dribble of water that goes across the street that occasionally floods our area. I want to just say, imagine if I drop this in your driveway, even if it's to the side. Imagine the traffic that's going to block up your single lane access in and out of your house, because that's what you'd be doing to me. So I ask you to please represent my community in this sense and do not approve these changes. Okay, thank you. Uh, before you step away, any questions? Any questions? M Mr. Chair, I have a question for staff, uh, Mr. Chair. Let me ask you one question. I'm sorry, I should have asked you when you stepped up there. Have you been sworn? Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. What was it, David? Um, on the issue of the maintenance of that roadway, um, the agenda memo says that it's a county maintained residential road. I just, I just want to make sure that I'm asking staff whether that's whether, whether that's accurate given the representation that was just made. I'm asking staff the question, not not to speak. Could the staff respond to that, please? Hello, this is Stacy Burgess. From my understanding, it is a uh, maintained. I'm looking at Pasco Mapper right now, and it's saying that it's a road maintained by Pasco County. All right. Well, we have a conflict of information here, uh, <laughs> State. Uh, so, are we sure that that's a county maintained road, or is, are we just <laughs> right now we're supposing, or we're sure? Well, I'm wondering if it's just if it's maintained only for a certain distance, and maybe that's the source of the confusion. Do we know? I guess I'll ask Stacy. How far do we maintain the roadway? Christy, you gonna say something? Yeah, I just, I believe that the answer to that question will have to come from project management. So, and they're not on the line. So that, that's something that we'll have to research and have ready before the board. I, I don't think beyond what we can see on, on Mapper, we can know uh, exactly at what point the county stops maintaining it. And, and David's probably correct that that's the case. I can address okay, that so that, that's, a, that's, a, that's a pretty central I can address uh, that in my presentation. Issue. I can address that in my presentation. Barbara, okay. All right. So let's go, let's continue to move like we've been moving and then Barbara, that'll be one of the points you'll need to address. Okay. We have All one right. more. So who, who's we have next one more to speak? Hello, my name is Sharon Honeywell Johnson. I've been a resident of Meadowbrook Estates for 30 years. Um, <laughs> first I'd like to me. clarify. John, Sorry? Have you been sworn? Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you very much. And your address was again, I didn't hear the address. My address is 17300 Riverstone Drive. 
Oh, I've been a resident you. of Meadowbrook for 30 years. Thank we you. have fought kitty daycare like the, the prior speaker back in 2011. I want everybody to realize that this is not going to be a daycare center. I do know what the intention of this property is going to be, which is a gas station car wash. The exit for this development is going to be on Metal Brook Drive. And nobody, I think, has addressed that to, to the board. The entrance will be off of State Road 54, but you will have an additional entrance and exit off of State Road, uh, off of Metal Brook Drive. It is a single lane in, a single lane out. We have traffic backups now. We cannot even imagine allowing commercial use coming into there with the exit coming onto our little residential road, which we, for the most part, maintain that road. The county maintains the first, I think, 15 feet or you were when you first come in. But after that, we have called and complained about flooding, but they say it's not their, their job to maintain our, our neighborhood. Um, the, I know that the notice that is posted currently, they never changed the date out there. You have James that lives directly behind this parcel that drove all the way out to Land Lakes Boulevard because it still has the February 18th date on it. We were all notified of the change of the date. But they never sent out a letter to this gentleman. He never received a letter. And he is adjacent to this property, which I thought was a requirement for the petitioner to also do, which has not been done. We believe our neighborhood has been fighting this for the last 10 years to keep this residential. We cannot have any more traffic coming in and out at this intersection. We will not be able to get out. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, next. That is all at the kiosk, sir. Okay, that's everyone? Okay. All right, Barbara, I guess you're up. There may be people online, sir. There are speakers, yes. There are oh, speakers okay. online. All right. Who's first online? Um, I do see for this item, I do see Wanda Neal. Wanda Neal, is that what you said? Yes. Okay. So we'll need her to be sworn, if not already? Yes. So, Ms. Neal, if you can hear us, um, would you please um, state your name and address for the record, and the clerk will swear you in. I'm not hearing anything. Okay, I see uh, uh, Ms. Dempian uh, being on there as well. So, Ms. Dempian, would you please state your name and address for the record, and the clerk will swear you in. Yes, ma'am. My name is Jessica Stempian. I live at 1102 Wildwood Lane, Lutes, Florida, 33558, and I have been sworn in. Uh, good afternoon, commissioners. I want to make the point of flow through traffic. For this item, our neighborhood connects to Loose Lake Fern, and I'm concerned about the amount of traffic that will be cutting through to avoid traffic on Highway 54 or going in the opposite direction, trying to get to a new gas station or whatever other commercial use there might be there. Our neighborhood has no sidewalks, no bike lanes. And that is a concern for safety to me. I am also a part of the Sierra Pines Coalition in our neighborhood where we have been working on flooding issues for a long time. And that canal is the Sandy Branch Tributary Canal. And I am concerned about the flooding impacts from whatever gets developed on that property. But I just wanted to make a point and point out to you all that you can cut through our neighborhood. People do it all the time. You know, we are just two miles east of the Sun Coast. You know, there's the North Point light and then the Sun Coast light. Uh, and then there's a the Ballantrae light when you go further east on Highway 54. And I don't know if you're familiar with the traffic conditions of Highway 54 along that stretch. I just believe that changing it to commercial use is going to further add to that traffic. 
We have buses coming in and out of our neighborhood. And like another speaker said, that Meadowbrook is very small. It's going to lead to some safety concerns that need to be considered. And if we were to keep it residential, it would fit more with what our current uh, conditions are. So I just wanted to make that point and thank you for your time. All right, thank you very much. Okay, now we'll try Wanda Neal again. Ms. Neal, if you would please state your name for the record and your address and whether you've been sworn. Okay, so we'll try then uh, Jennifer Robertson. Ms. Robertson, if you would please state your name and address for the record and whether you've been sworn. I've been sworn. My name is Jennifer Robertson, 17245 Drive, 33558. Um, I do want to state that uh, no one has mentioned the trucks that would come and go from a commercial property. No one has really given a good example of how wide Meadowbrook is. Meadowbrook, where the in and out would probably end up for that property. It is so narrow that if a car comes from a side street, you have to stop and wait for a, an oncoming car so that you can make a turn because it's not wide enough for two cars. And it would, it is um, maintained by the residents. It's news to anyone that lives there that are that when we have to pay for our our uh, road to be paved. Um, I don't understand where the county thinks that they're paying for it because it comes out of our pocket. Um, the, there's just no room for commercial property on that intersection. I do not, I do not believe that that is a collector road. I think of a collector road as the neighbor, the neighborhood, the residential properties come off of a side and then collect like um, Ballantrae or Bexley. Uh, these residential houses lie exactly and directly on that property. I am one of the ones that have contacted um, James Collins about the meeting, um, but he didn't get all of the information since I've been out of town that the meeting had gotten moved. Um, it, it seems to be we're having to chase this meeting, which seems quite unfair to us. They're not changing their notifications. They're not notifying the residents, uh, even, even directly um, adjacent to the property. They're not putting the sign that's posted, that's supposed to be posted. I took a picture of it just yesterday. It still says February date. So I don't see how you can continue um, and agree that this this hearing, this uh, meeting has been um, publicized at all. And, and I don't understand how you can put a commercial right in our next door lot. All right, thank you very much. And did we have one more person that wanted to speak? Mr. Chair, David? let's try one more time for Ms. Wanda Neal. Uh, let's see if, um, I, I still see her on, but it doesn't show as if she has a, a way of speaking. It doesn't show a microphone or anything like that. Um, so Ms. Wanda Neal, if you're there, would you please state your name and address for the record and whether you've been sworn? Let's try this again. We do have a call in number and we've just unmuted that person just in case it's Ms. Neal. Ms. Neal, okay. would you please state your name and address for the record and whether you've been sworn?
Hello, can you hear me? Hello? Yes, we can, can hear you. Can you hear me? Yay! I'm so excited. Sorry. Hi, my name is Wanda Neal. I am a resident of Sierra Pines. I live at 17238 Bridal Path Court. Um, I have been a resident for seven years, and um, I, I just like to state a couple things. One, since my time here as a resident, I was not aware of the age of the subdivision. I didn't look into that when we purchased, and I was not aware of all the flooding issues that we have been battling apparently long before I started. Um, it's interesting Wanda, that. Uh, Wanda, sorry? Wanda. Yes. Before you continue, yes, just just want to make sure you've been sworn. Oh yes, I've been sworn. I'm sorry. Okay, that's fine. Go right ahead. Sure. Um, there have been numerous attempts, and, and as Jessica stated, Jessica Stempian stated, there has been a coalition that has been formed to try to help alleviate a lot of these issues, which she has been a big part of. And I thank you for those of you who have participated in helping us alleviate these issues. But as an older subdivision. We are not privy to a lot of the privileges that a lot of the newer subdivisions have. And therefore, any time that there is a new subdivision, they dewater. When they dewater, that water comes into us and it leads to more of our flooding problems. Um, I've done some research about potential um, uses. For example, if that were a gas station, there has been a study by John Hopkins University that shows that even the little drips, um, that people, you know, when you go to shake off the gas from your, when you're pumping gas, those little drips seep into the concrete and that and those little drips accumulate. And in a 10 year period of time, a huge amount of that water or of that of those gasoline particulates go into the groundwater system, um, including ben benzapine. I'm sorry, I don't know if I'm saying it correctly, but it is a carcinogen, carcinogen, excuse me. Since we are all um, responsible for our own potable water, our drinking water, our you know usable water, the water that our pets and our animals drink, that goes into our well systems, which trust me is a pain in the butt to, to maintain anyway if you're not a scientist. Secondly, um, I heard mention about the roadways and as the other speakers have stated, um, it is a very narrow roadway. In fact, many times when they opened up um, construction behind um, the, uh, the area north of us, I'm sorry, it would be to the east of us um, where the little restaurants are, there have been trucks that have made a wrong turn and come into our subdivision and have had a very difficult time finding a way to turn around because there are narrow and small roads. Third, um, there are no other exits onto 54 for our entire subdivision, which is a pretty big subdivision. We only have that one exit. It's a, a single, you know, two lane road, like right and left. Um, and there, and it just recently was expanded to include the traffic light and a turning lane at the traffic light at 54. The other exit to our property is actually at the back of the property, and I think Jessica mentioned that. And that is on Hillsborough County Road. It's a Hillsborough County property um, zoning area, so they get no Pasco County taxes, and so therefore they do not maintain that road whatsoever. In fact, people come in off and dump, and it's our residents that are cleaning up that road. They do not maintain. There's potholes and all sorts of things. The only reason that they are allowing us to maintain that or keep that road open is because we have um, agreed to maintain it because it is the only exit way out of our subdivision. So God forbid there's a flood or a, an emergency or a fire or the roads are blocked. We have no other alternative unless we try to fly away. So those are three main reasons I would like Okay, that beep was at the time. That was the time. Okay. Told yes, that was the time. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, anyone else, Denise? Mr. Chair, that was the the last speaker that we had on our list that is actually on um, WebEx at the moment. Okay. And we you. have no one else at the kiosk. You've heard from all the kiosk um, folks. Okay, so we can hear from the applicant now. Yeah, Mr. Well, Chair, Denise, Mr. Chair, yes, before the applicant speaks, could we get her to confirm she wants, still wants to proceed with rebuttal given the audio issues we're having with WebEx? I just want to make sure that she heard all the opposition. Yes, I did, and I'd like to proceed. Good, okay, thank you, David. Denise, can you uh, put our PowerPoint up? Yes, I will. Just give me a second. Thank you. As Denise is putting that up, there's some I can address um, comments, um, questions, 
that are, I don't necessarily have applied for, so I can start with that. We did follow all the county's notice requirements. Um, the notices that are sent out were sent out as required by the county. The notices specifically state that time um, meeting dates can change. And so the um, responsibility is to contact the county or myself, because I signed the letters with my uh, phone number and email on them, or you can obviously they can check the website and see that it's been continued as well. We, as far as um, flooding goes, we would be happy to meet with the residents, um, with the county and our engineer and the residents. Um, design has not started on this parcel. This would make it a perfect time to share information. So um, we would offer to do that. We've done that in the past successfully. Um, if we just focus on flooding and concerns about flooding, it can be productive. As far as the transportation issues, they, um, Meadowbrook Drive from State Road 54 to Rainbow Lane, which is south of these parcels, is a county maintained 60 feet of right of way. I think the confusion that you hear is because just because it's a county maintained road doesn't mean that, that the residents don't get assessed, assessed for improving it. And so maybe they were assessed before for paving, uh, paving improvements. I think that's all over the news right now, better call banking <laughs> about that procedure. So I think that gets confusion when, when, when residents are having to pay paving assessments, but that happens on county maintained roads. But all the records, I don't think there's any confusion, the records are just county maintained. We went through a substandard road review and in connection with this application and staff looked at and determined that um, that the segment that our uh, project would use of Meadowbrook is standard. And as it's been pointed out to you, the, that intersection is signalized. There's a left turn lane, a dedicated left turn lane, um, as well as a um, right turn lane uh, coming from Meadowbrook going north of State Road 54. We also went through timing and phasing review um, in connection with this application, which deals with the capacity of these roads and intersections to handle the project traffic. And at the time of act at the time of site plan construction plan review, we have to go through the third review, which is the ge geometry of practice management. So we will be going through that review. Um, thank you, Denise. If you can the next slide. So as you've heard, I'm just going to summarize a few things and just point out a few things. Um, to give perspective, as you've heard from staff, who did a very thorough job of giving you two very thorough reports. Um, and I, I put this presentation together not to duplicate, but just to try to bring some perspective to a few things. We're located in the South Market area, urban concentration area. This property fronts on State Road 54, a six lane arterial highway, located at a signalized intersection approximately three quarters of a mile east of the Suncoast Parkway. There are no other commercial uses at this signalized intersection. This is clearly an underutilization of the county's and FDOT's investments in infrastructure at this location. This is a six lane arterial roadway, signalized intersection at an intersection with a collector road, which has not been disputed now. Um, I, I guess it's been admitted to. Staff's been very clear that um, the status of the roads. Um, I think the neighbor's clear that they're object to any use but residential. This is absolutely not the place for a residential use. I also want to point out, think, thinking about it, that if you do not place commercial uses at signalized intersections, then you put pressure on unsignalized intersections to become signalized. So totally uh, a waste of a signalized intersection if you are not locating your, not, your commercial uses at that location. The property is currently zoned AR1. Oh, I got a typo there, excuse me. Um, an AR1, you can read what the description of that is. The important part of that is it talks about curtailing urban development in areas which lack facilities until such time as those facilities are available. So even the very zoning district that's on this property, that's been sitting on this property, recognizes that there's a, a change in circumstances when infrastructure is invested in by the government. Water and sewer is, is right at this location. And as I've explained, you know, what type of roadway we're talking about and what kind of intersection we're talking about. 
conditions have changed and all facilities are at this location. And so I just, you have multiple uh, rezoning considerations. They're not criteria, they're considerations, but I put a couple of them there um, as to what you would consider uh, four and 13 relative to um, those considerations. Next slide. What's kind of unique about this conference of plan amendment that I don't get to come before you and say very often is that there's a clear policy direction from the board adopted into the conference of plan that specifically directs where they want commercial land uses. This application strictly complies with that direction. The board weighs out the policy decisions of what should go where and prioritizing land uses. And they specifically said this is a location where when you meet this criteria, that this would be a location where we want to see um, commercial. Not only want to see it, you only can do commercial in these locations. So it's a, it's a very interesting policy um, that has lots of specificity to it. There's three criteria. Staff have gone through it um, with you, the A, B, and C and we meet all three of those um, criteria and it has not been disputed, that policy 1.6.2 has not been, dis was not disputed in Mr. Pressman's presentation. Um, there is policy 1.6.4 that has been cited. I know Mr. Pitos is on the line and he certainly can explain, uh, we're complying with 1.6.2. Um, we do not have to comply with 1.6.4 because we're complying with 1.6.2. The subject property is the location for C2 uses, and that I, I did the re rezoning considerations that uh, relate to that. C2 is clearly consistent with COM land use. I think I've said this to the Planning Commission before. When you look at consistency, COM, C2, you know, they go together. You know, you could, if you have a residential land use and you're doing certain things zoning-wise, sometimes it's a question, but here, C2 is absolutely consistent with the COM land use. And quite frankly, maintaining an existing zoning of agricultural residential in this location is, is absolutely inconsistent with the comp plan. And that's why you have rezoning actions and that's why you have comp plan changes because things change. Next slide. This complies as staff has told you with the, with tradi uh, the transitional land uses. They've gone through that very clearly with you. With regard to the residential compatibility and buffer standards, I've, I've, I've um, listed all the LDC requirements, buffering, building height, lighting, on-site parking, stacking, loading outside, ref loading outside, loading comma, outside refuse, storage, trees, landscaping, those all apply. And this isn't the first time we have ever had a commercial use next to a residential use. They coexist often. And so the, the code has already been written to address these concerns. With regard to the additional buffering discussion, I would be happy to work with staff and, and, and neighbors, the neighbor, and uh, to our south to add a deed restriction to talk about what we can put within our buffer, you know, and we can have that conversation and add a deed restriction. It's absolutely, um, absolutely fine to do and reasonable. Next um, slide. This is a, a quote from our um, real estate expert. And what's, if you compare it to the expert that Mr. Pressman presented to you, those are all conclusory statements that were made. But I actually wanna to read to you what this expert put forth because I think the facts that he puts forth here put a lot of perspective on this location. So this is, this is the expert, the real estate expert for the applicant. With regard to the value of the adjacent properties, the three, prop the three properties are located, because we have three adjacent properties, the three properties are locate located approximately zero feet, 180 feet, and 370 feet from a six lane arterial highway and are next to vacant unmaintained parcels. As such is our professional opinion that the development of the subject property for C2 uses would not result in lower property values. As for non-adjacent properties in the general vicinity, it is common for commercial uses to be located at a signalized entrance to a neighborhood, and it's our professional opinion that the residential and commercial uses can coexist without creating 
a negative impact on their respective values. With that, I think I, I've responded to the different things that were raised. If I didn't address something, I'd be happy to. Um, but we would ask that the um, Planning Commission, sitting as the LPA, um, make a recommendation that um, the comp plan amendment is consistent with the comp plan. And then I think it's a separate motion required to make a recommendation um, for the rezoning. If you use the future for the property, is going to be. Sorry. Okay. Barbara, can you hear me? Ask me now. Okay. There was a discussion by the by some of the residents that the specific to the future use of the, the property being a gas station. Is there any plan for future years that, that, that you could share with us? So that is an, um, a permitted use in C2, which has found, been found to be Correct. consistent by your staff. So that is, that is a potential use. Do you have any, are there any plans for your, that your, your applicant is, is considering there? Is, is gas possible use there? It, it, is, it is a possible use of the location. There are no, when you, y'all have to think about this in your mind, when you're driving east on State Road 54 and you pass Suncoast Parkway and you're going east on your right hand side, you're driving along, you're driving along, you're driving along, you have to go all the way to Collier Parkway for there to be gas. So this could be a location where you would have a convenience store with gas pumps. Well, I have a question, Peter Hansel. I don't know if is there a, there is a there is a large there is a significant jump between the agriculture of current zoning for that area to a C2 and i think it's common knowledge that when you go to a C2 you open a, a large variety of facilities that can go in there and perhaps that's what the residents are concerned about going to a C2 is there a possibility that it could go to a C1 which reduces the number of commercial construction uh, businesses that go into that facility and may reduce the anxiety of residents there. So my answer to that would be that they oppose the daycare and they clearly said to you today that they wanted to remain a residential use. My other thing, my other, my other comment to that is that this is not a place to underutilize property. This is not a location to underutilize property. I concur with your, your logic and the fact that it's a four way intersection and that it, <clears throat> that it eventually will lead to some type of business going in there. That's a given because of the commercial uh, businesses like those four way intersections like that. You brought that up. That's an extremely good point. But they also, I hear the residents have a concern on what can go in there. And that's why my concern is the C2 zoning for that area so i just that's how i feel about it so i guess the question anybody else have any questions yeah this is jamie girardi i mean obviously this is a <clears throat> when it comes down to land use it's always a, a difficult use and, and land use and zoning um I mean, a lot of the points that were made today were dwelled on the fact that it is the intersection it's a signalized intersection of an ar arterial and a collector roadway um I mean, from a planning perspective, I think it makes perfect sense. Um, a lot of the issues that were raised today for traffic, for stormwater, for pollution, all those items will be hashed out during the design process. And that's important for everybody to know. Um, I mean, the stormwater concerns, the flooding concerns. When I look at it, it's GIS for the known flooding problems, they're quite a bit south. Yes, they're within the neighborhood, but they're south of this intersection. And there are regulations out there and there, there are things that the developers have to follow whenever they want to develop a piece of property. Um, as far as, you know, design standards, they have to meet. Um, I guess the, the only question that I have, and, and maybe this is for staff, but when this use does come in, as far as the landscape buffering, is the landscape buffering on the south of the property what, what standard would that fall under? I mean, I know there's an adjacent waterway to the south. So therefore, are they buffering the waterway or are they buffering the residential use that's on the other side of the waterway? 
Mr. Chairman, this is uh, Brad Tippin, Development Review Manager. Oh, I can speak to that. Uh, thanks, uh, Commissioner. Uh, essentially, what will happen is, is until we actually know the use that's going to be there and we actually see a design layout that essentially will show us uh, where structures may be on the site, where parking might be on the site, playgrounds, if it's a daycare type of facility, um, other things, where those things are actually on the site uh, and where stormwater is proposed on the site, things of that nature. Uh, we would look at all of those items when we're, when we're considering the buffer. And there's a basic buffer between, uh, in the land development code, uh, between a commercial and a residential area. Uh, so they, they discussed earlier that the comprehensive plan requires that this actually have an increased buffer. So what we would do is we take that basic buffer that's required uh, between commercial and residential, and that is going to be there. Uh, that's going to be there all the way around the site, uh, wherever the commercial abuts residential. Then we're going to look at what is actually physically on the design, what is where, and we're going to, at that point, say, okay, with this piece to properly buffer, you're going to need to do these types of improvements. And, and we're going to have a kind of a unique plan that will buffer the pieces that need to be more heavily buffered uh, to make sure that those residential areas are adequately buffered. Uh, now, we do that, uh, again, based on this, this is a rezoning. So based on this zoning, we would do that same process for any use that were to come in here. Uh, additionally, in that regard, uh, the access management, I heard that was mentioned a few times with the road and, and people being able to get to and from the subdivision and traffic and things of that nature. Uh, no matter what use comes into this site, uh, the access management would need to be addressed at the time of those site plan reviews. Uh, so if something is going to put more traffic onto these roads, then they may need to improve those intersections uh, and make some improvements in that area to ensure that, that all of that can be done safely. So all of those issues are actually addressed at the time of site plan review for any type of use that would come in under this zoning. And if for some reason a, a, a use comes in that can't meet the standards that we set for them in that regard, uh, then essentially that use isn't going to be able to be there unless they uh, put in some additional deed restrictions or something to, to limit their impacts or, or come back to this body for some form of rezoning uh, to be able to work through those. Mr. Chair, can I ask Mr. Tippett a question? Hey, sure, of course. Um, Brad, could you address the public note that's provided at the time of site plan approval and to weigh in on the site plan conditions or landscaping or at the time of site plan approval? Yes, at the time of uh, site plan review, uh, there is a, another notice that is required to the surrounding area based on code requirements. Uh, and the individuals that would receive that notice would have uh, a minimum of 30 days to contact the county and, and make arrangements to look at the plans and see what's being, uh, being provided for. And then they can also provide feedback at that time. Uh, that is one of the, the opportunities that, that still exists. Uh, I believe that uh, Ms. Wilhite did say uh, that she was going to or was willing to possibly meet with the neighbors ahead of that time possibly even before a site plan would be submitted at all uh, to come up with some plans as to how to buffer those areas and, and some, some deed restrictions as to what could go in those areas. So, uh, so some of those things may be addressed with some of the, the residents ahead of time, even before it's submitted to the county for review. Uh, but even after it's submitted to the county, 30 days, a minimum of 30 days prior to any approval that we would offer, uh, there will be additional notice that would go out uh, to those that are certainly abutting the property within a particular distance uh, to to be able to see that information. So Brad, if, if a resident thought that staff's buffering was inconsistent with the comp plan, um, could that be appealed to the planning commission? Uh, 
Absolutely. Uh, the first step that we would do is, is the resident may make comments to us uh, during that review process after they receive notice and we can forward those comments to the applicant. Uh, if the applicant is willing to address and look at some of the uh, some of those concerns and maybe make some changes, uh, that is certainly uh, uh, the applicant's prerogative. They, they can do that. If the applicant uh, does not want to do that uh, and everything else is within the requirements uh, uh, that we're expecting of them, uh, then yes, once we issue the approval, uh, anyone can appeal the decision if they believe that we applied either a comprehensive plan policy or a land development code element incorrectly. That answers all my questions, Mr. Chair. Thank you. All right. Thank you, David. And uh, uh, <clears throat> thank you, Brad. Um, anybody else have any questions? I've got one more comment that I think it's important because, I mean, we heard, I think, from uh, at least Ms. Robertson and, and Ms. Neal, I believe, about the seems to be a conflict between maintenance of the, the road, the county or, or public. They clearly seem to think that they're they're paying for maintenance of the road. So that's something that should be reconciled before it, it goes beyond us. Yeah. Mr. Chairman, this, uh, can I speak? Yes, please. Uh, this is Amir Jamali, Transportation Planner with Planning and Development Department. I just want to confirm Middlebrook Drive is a county maintained road from SR 54 to half mile south of SR 54. And this is a 24 foot wide road, and the piece in frontage of the subject parcel has been recently resurfaced and it is in a good shape. Okay, so how far do you maintain it from 54? Half a mile, half a mile. A half a mile, okay. Yes. Okay, thank you very much. Appreciate that information. Okay. And that clears that up. So otherwise, it's a county maintained road for half a mile. All right, that's my understanding. Is that right? Yes, yes. Okay. Yeah, I understand too. Yeah. Thank you very much, Amir. Um, yeah, my, I mean, my input is basically that, um, you know, in trying to, I try to always put myself in the position of the both property owners, the residents and the person who wants to develop the property. It's always a balance of, of property rights. And uh, I'm a strong proponent of property rights. But I do think that uh, we need to provide some kind of protection from for the residents that live in that area. They're very, very close to this property. And, uh, and I certainly wouldn't want, um, people walking back and forth from a seven 11, for example, to, you know, to my home, walk across my property, or I know how that, how that gets, I I'm deal with that all the time. So, um, I would like to make sure that, that if it's voted to be approved, that, uh, we we agree right here and now today that that the buffer uh, conversation is going to come back before uh, this board before any any final approval. Otherwise, I wouldn't vote to approve it unless there was at least a solid wall between this property and the residential property. So that's my that's my opinion. Just sharing it with the board, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> yes. This, Mr. Chairman. Yes, hey, Terry. This is Terry Pizzo's planning and development. Um, to bring the buffer yards back to the planning commission uh, before any final approval could take uh, a very long time. Um, it's usually handled during the site plan review process, as Brad had previously indicated, which mm -hmm. follows the land use establishment and uh establishment as well okay terry i misunderstood then i thought brad said that uh um if there's any disagreement between the property owners and the applicant that it would come back to the board for for consideration during the site plan review process there is the opportunity to appeal and bring the actual site plan to the planning commission at that point okay all right not not, not during these proceedings Okay. 
Uh, and let me ask the applicant, that would the applicant have any objection to uh, putting up a solid petition between uh, this subject property and the residential properties that you know of? The B buffer, that's the minimum buffer, requires a um, six foot fence. Uh, I'm trying to pull up the landscape requirements. But again, if, if, if we need to, to sit down before now on the board and come up with a deed restriction and go through this with staff, we can make it a minimum. Um, and we can have the conversation again. Uh, we absolutely agree with you, with Chairman. I just a little hard to do it on the fly. But I um, absolutely agree with you that buffering is important. And the, the comp plan agrees with you that buffering is important. So we'd be happy to do that. Okay. Um, all right. Yeah. My, you know, my, my vote would be not to approve it unless I know there's going to be some kind of a solid buffer between the, the property let me and see the... If I can, let me see if I can get an answer here. We are a little bit challenged. So I can't sit in the same room with my client, so... I understand, I understand Barbara. Yeah, take, take your time. Uh, Mr. Yeah, Chairman, sure. this is Brad Tippin. I, I can maybe speak a little bit further to that, if you like. Hey, Brad. Sure. Yeah, go right ahead. Uh, yeah, the, the type B buffer that would be required, uh, it requires a six-foot-tall opaque visual screen uh, at a minimum. And like I said before, uh, the, the comprehensive plan, because this is a commercial use in this area, very specifically says that you have to go above and beyond that standard. Uh, so it would be perfectly reasonable for us to, at the time of site plan uh, review, to request that this be a, uh, a wall and also that it be anywhere uh, from six to eight feet, depending on, on what would be visually appropriate uh, in the area. Uh, again, until we actually have the plan in front of us, it's difficult mm -hmm. to tell where some of those things would be necessary um, right. because a, a wall is often unsightly as well. Uh, so, you know, there, there may be a place where, where certain types of combinations of landscaping are more appropriate, and there may be places where other features such as walls would be appropriate. But until we actually have that design down the road, uh, we can't necessarily say what that would be and what would be appropriate where. So that's that's why we like to go ahead and do that, and then we can allow the appeal process to proceed after the fact uh, if indeed the neighbors disagree with the way that we applied that. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm doing one. I'm doing one right now where we're, we're requiring a green wall. Basically, it's a wall with a, you know, with growth on it, so it's always green. But uh, Barbara, did you say something? Yeah, I can add to that. You know, I, when, and looking at the type B, the type B requires screening to six feet at installation or within one year. But it allows you a variety of ways to do it. And I think this is what you're getting at, Chairman. It allows you to have a pig fence, wall, berm, or hedge, or some combination of those. So it sounds like what, what you're asking is for us to either do the opaque fence or the wall so that we actually have a barrier and not just a landscape or barrier that somebody could go through. And so, again, I, we can do a deed restriction that says, you know, we do a fence or a wall. Again, we can kind of work on that exactly which one is best and not do it on the fly. But I get, I get the point that, that you want to see something more than landscaping there, and we're agreeable to that. Yeah, because I, I know how that happens. People hanging around a, a convenience store you know, walking across people's yards and it's just not, it's not appropriate. So I think we have an obligation to protect the residents there and still give the landowner an opportunity to develop his land properly. Obviously he's not gonna build a house there. And it's not appropriate for that either. So um, as, a, as I say, it's a balancing act and I think it's our responsibility to make sure that we try to balance the interests of all parties. So, uh, Mr. Chair, can I, can I ask a question? So, sorry, David. Yeah, go yeah. Ahead. Um, so, what you're asking for would require a deed restriction, as Barbara mentioned. Are you comfortable with staff working on that deed restriction with the applicant between now and the board meeting, or did you want to see the deed restriction before you vote on it? That's really the question. Is that a question to me or to Barbara? Well, to you and the planning commission. Because oh, okay. that's what you do. Right. Because if you want to see the deed restriction first, you'd have to continue the item. 
if you're comfortable with staff and the applicant working on it between now and the board, then just let it proceed. Um, I'm comfortable with the staff uh, working on it, but if the residents, you know, have a have a strong opinion or don't agree, then I want to make sure we have an opportunity to take another bite of the apple. Otherwise, I'd like to see what it is before it's work it goes to the commission. Well, I think if they're not happy with that, I mean, I guess it's possible the board could remand it back to the planning commission. Um, if there's a disagreement over the deed restriction, it's it the planning commission as to how you want to handle this. If, if you can either continue it until you see that deed restriction, or you can let it move forward. Soon the staff will work out that issue with the applicant. Okay. Um, well, let me see what kind of a motion that we can get from the from the board here. Well, one one question before that, Mr. Chair, if I if I could. So, yeah. David, that continued to be under the zoning amendment, correct? So we could let the uh, the comprehensive plan amendment go forward and continue the zoning amendment. Is that what you're suggesting? Well, I'm not suggesting anything. You could let them both go forward. I'm just, but yes, to answer your question, you you the deed restriction would not be part of the comp plan amendment. It would be part of the zoning. So yes, you could let the comp plan amendment move forward and and hold back and continue the rezoning if you wanted to. Okay. With that, I, I, I can make a motion. Sure. Okay. Yeah. I'd make a motion to approve the, uh, the comprehensive plan amendment as presented. Do we have a second? Amy Girardi, I'll second that. Okay. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion on the motion? Well, my only concern is I hear the words request. Nothing compels the developer to do any action, really, because request is not an action word for the most part. Once we approve this to a C2. Well, this to be clear, he, he, he did not make a motion on, on the rezoning yet. He only made a motion. Yeah, this is only the comp plan this amendment. The comp plan, yeah. This is not the rezoning. Well, that's the next thing we got to deal with. Okay, so if there's no further discussion, let's vote by roll call. All in favor, signify by saying aye, nay, in opposition. Jamie Girardi? Aye. Peter Hansel? No. Roberto Saez? Aye. Christopher Pohl? Aye. Chris Williams? No. And Chairman Charles Gray? Aye. Okay, now uh, about the uh, uh, the actual rezoning itself, uh, we need a motion to either continue or, um, or approve that motion. I understand it. Is that right, David? Yes, you would either continue it or move for approval or denial. One of those three. Or deny. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. May I hear a motion? I'll make the motion to continue. Go ahead. Okay, we have a motion to continue. Do I have a second? I second. We have a second. Any further discussion of the motion? And just for clarification, the, the request is for the applicant to come back with a deed restriction for the buffering requirements on the property. Is that right? That David, that's that's right, correct? Well, uh, yes, if that's the planning commission's direction to the applicant that you're continuing it so that you can see that deed restriction, then yes, that, that would be the reason for the continuance. You do need to state how long you want to continue it though. Is this 30 days or, or to win? So if I could jump in as the applicant, we are agreeable to a continuance. It looks like your next planning commission is March 25th, which is three weeks from now. Um, so that's plenty of time for us to diligently work on a deed restriction. And if for some reason we still weren't there, you could continue it again. Um, but okay. we'd ask for the 25th. Sounds good. Me. The only thing I'd like to add to that is I, I think just for clarification, we're talking about the buffers on the west and the south side of the property, correct? Yes. Okay. Yeah. 
Originally, I was thinking of all four sides. <laughs> I just wanted That's to make sure the waterway south wasn't changed the position. Mr. Chairman, can I uh, comment briefly? Yes, yes, sir, Brad. I, I apologize, this is Brad Tippin again. Uh, in regard to developing a deed restriction, uh, to, to really do that effectively, uh, it, it is going to require uh, some level of, of a knowledge of what use is going to go there again and, and what the site design may be uh, to really have the best uh, the best use. By, by actually going in this direction, you may un, uh, unwittingly uh, tie our hands as staff into a particular type of buffering final design comes in may not be what would be best for the site. Uh, we can we can certainly pursue that. I would also just like to know that uh, uh, however, whatever timeline you're looking at as far as a continuance does allow us to meet on this with the applicant and the neighbors as necessary uh, and also allows us enough time to get that documentation into the various systems for public notice that we need to civic etc we have some some deadlines for uploading documents uh so i don't know how quickly we can turn that around i would say at the very earliest it would be uh the next hearing in date city uh in april to be able to meet all the deadlines that we would need to meet possibly longer there's april first. Right, well, there's april first. I, 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 April so either, 1st, either, yeah, there's March 25th or April 1st. They're one week apart, interestingly enough. Um, you guys have okay. your meetings one week apart. But I would I would just say a couple things we can do, Brad, is we can work on minimum language. We can always put the unless otherwise approved at the time of site plan in case we get it wrong. I mean, I think there's different things that we can do. I mean, you can hear I want to work this out. I agree with the, the comments. And, um, if it's April 1st as opposed to March 25th, that gives you more time. Let's do that. That that would that would be preferable uh, for for our team. Okay. All right. So um, I would say uh, we'd ask for a motion then, for somebody to make a motion that we continue it to the April 1st meeting. Amend the motion to April 1st. Okay. And since the motion is amended to April 1st. And we have a second. Who is the second? Chris second. And whether it was Chris. me or uh, Roberto. <laughs> Roberto did too. Two A, two B. Okay. Well, we got a second and a third, <laughs> so we're good. <laughs> okay. All right. So we have a motion. We have a second. Any further discussion of the motion? All in favor of the motion, signify by roll call, aye or nay, as as you wish. Jamie Girardi. Aye. Peter Hansel? Aye. Roberto Sides? Aye. Christopher Poole? Aye. Chris Williams? Aye. And Chairman Charles Gray? Aye. Okay, Mr. Chair, Thank just for you. clarification and for everyone who's listening, um, the, the um, continuance date is April 1st, 2021 at 1.30 in Dade City. You got it. Okay, thank you. All right, so we've got one last item on the agenda today. Okay. And if I can share my screen, give me a minute. Okay, so hopefully everyone can see my screen. And uh, this is, uh, we're calling it Land Development Code Amendment 47. It's PDD 210282. Uh, this is basically amending uh, Chapter 500, Section 526C2. Subsection 526.3, conditional uses, removing multiple family dwellings as a conditional use. The genesis of this uh, change is that on February 9th, 2021, the Board of County Commissioners directed the Planning and Development Department to bring forward a standalone modification to Land Development Code, removing multiple family dwelling units as potential conditional uses in the C2. Uh, just to let the Planning Commission know that the Land Development Code currently allows multiple family dwellings in the MF1, MF2, and MF3 districts. That's not going away. That continues to be the case. And additionally, multiple family dwelling units may also be allowed through a master plan unit development district. Um, we're requ requesting that you find the proposed ordinance consistent with the Pasco County Comprehensive Plan and recommend approval of the ordinance to the Board of County Commissioners. 
This is scheduled for first reading before the board on the 23rd of March at 1.30 in Newport Ritchie and also um, for adoption by the board on April 7th at 1.30 in Dade City. And I am here for any questions you may have. Okay, Do, does anybody have any questions about it? Denise, this is Jamie Girardi. Um, just from a timing perspective, is a conditional use or going through the conditional use process faster than going through a rezoning process? It is not. It takes the same exact amount of time to go through a conditional use process and to go through a rezoning process. The requirements are still the same, the timing and phasing, substandard road, um, the applications are, are um, pretty much identical. The only difference between the conditional use and the rezoning in terms of application is that the conditional use requires a concept plan to be submitted as part of the application and a rezoning does not. You don't necessarily have to submit a concept plan. You still have to submit two signed and sealed surveys. There is also a slight difference or somewhat of a difference in the price, which is basically that a rezoning would cost you $850 plus $20 per acre or partial acre whereas a conditional use starts at 620 plus Chairman. $20 per acre or partial acre. Mr. Chairman, this is Terry Pitos. Yes, Terry. To add to Denise, the other basic uh, difference is also that on a conditional use, you can apply conditions. Whereas on a rezoning, you cannot apply conditions. Oh, okay. Yes, yeah. thank you, Terry, that's accurate. And let me add one more thing to that, which is the criteria for approving a conditional use are different than for a rezoning request. There's different criteria in the code. Yes, that's true as well. Okay, yeah, I mean, my only concern is that I understand what the board's direction here is and the way they're trying to go, but I'm just worried if there's any other unintended consequences here by moving forward with this ordinance. That's all. That was the purpose of my question. Yeah. And what, can, what is the real purpose for doing this? Just out of curiosity. Anybody have any ideas on that? Terry? Well, Ultimate, ultimately, I, um, based on the conversations that were had, is that I think the Board of County Commissioners wants to see commercial on on commercial uses, um, and they want to. They also want to see an inter integration of uses. So, if the if the conditional use for the multifamily existed together with other commercial uses integrated, um, I think they would prefer to see that. But what we're basically seeing on existing commercial commercially zoned properties is folks coming in to um, add multifamily, but then that becomes the sole use is the multifamily. So the way the land development code is currently in the MF2 and the MF3 districts, for example, not in MF1, but in MF2 and MF3, you can have that integration of commercial and multifamily uses because the multifamily district also allows commercial uses to serve the multifamily community, um, typically consistent with C1. Okay, any questions? Any other questions? All right, thank you. I think that was the last one, is that right, Denise? Huh? That is that is correct. No, there's, there is no public comment, is that correct? Um, I do see that there are at least three folks still on here, so I want to provide the opportunity for those to actually um, comment if they wish to comment. Um, okay. I do okay. see uh, Barbara Wilhite is on here, Mr. Joel too is on here, and I also see Marcy Esberg from Community Development. So potentially the, those uh, folks may want to comment, so. Okay. If they do, they're happy, I'm happy to hear them at this time. So step up. Mr. Chairman, Barb Wilhite, I, I have something I could add. Yeah. This is Barb Wilhite, 5327 Grand Boulevard, Newport, Florida, 34652. 
I'm not speaking on behalf of any client. I just want to make sure there's no unintended consequences here. And so I raise a concern and it has to do with affordable housing. Um, over all the years that I've done conditional uses for multifamily, with the exception of the one that has been controversial um, lately over in Wesley Chapel, they've all been done for affordable housing projects, whether that be senior or family. And so, and what you see is over in the west side, which is, you know, you gotta remember for those affordable projects, they're incentivized. And so they are only can go in certain locations where this, where you have a certain census tract, a certain um, population, um, a certain income level. So what we see over, let's say, for example, on US 19 is we have a lot of C2, a lot. We have a lot of ROR. And what you have to remember for these projects is what they really need is the land use category because res, uh, ROR has 20, 30 units per acre and mixed use, which you don't see as much of on 19, has 32 units per acre. So they need the land use. And so C2 is already located where that density is allowed. So my affordable clients have always said there's not enough multifamily in a land use classification um, and they can't go through a land use change. They can't make it within their time periods. Now, so I, I'd ask, as, as I, was, I think I've said, I haven't spoken to Commissioner Hildebrand in a long time, but she always used to say, let's not throw the baby out, baby was out with the bathwater. I don't know if my concerns are, are true and so I speak on behalf of myself only, um, but I wanna raise the concern. because I certainly don't wanna see it make it harder for us to have some of these affordable projects. Because remember when they apply for the lottery, you're competing statewide for money to bring this project to Pasco, these projects to Pasco to help our residents. And so if we're not competitive because we have our own profit and that makes it more difficult for these projects to be competitive, other counties will get the other money and their citizens will get these projects. So that's it, I appreciate you listening to me. Okay, thank you, Barbara. Mr. Anybody Chairman, else there? Yes, Mr. Chairman, Joel Two, if I might have a moment. Hey, Joel. Hi, uh, Joel Two, Two and Associates, Palm Harbor. Um, I only want to speak very briefly. I've been actively involved with this uh, at the board level. Um, I agree with Barbara. I, I, I think that the commissioner who, who made the motion was very well intentioned, but I think with respect, I think that we're just getting in a little bit too big of a hurry to try to do something in a knee jerk fashion dealing with this multifamily apartment issue. I don't know if any of you commissioners had a chance to review the industry expert presentation that was made by the private industry at the commissioner workshop. But if not, I would, I would suggest that if you have time, pull that up and look at the presentation about the market demand. And it's, it's not only the class A market demand, which is substantial, but also the changing demographic in Pasco County and the realities of the marketplace. Now, with respect to this particular proposal, uh, I'm assuming that it is for prospective application only so that anyone that already has a conditional use application in can pursue that. I, I don't know the answer to that. I'm sure that, that David likely does or Denise. Um, but my other concern is, I don't know why, since, since a conditional use has special criteria, as David said, because you can impose conditions on it, for example, the matter you just wrestled with on Barbara's other matter about conditioning requiring a wall, if this were conditional use, you could have simply imposed that condition in that conditional use approval, whether the applicant liked it or not, and said, if you want your conditional use at that location, you will build a wall, for example. So there's actually some merits. I don't know if the board's problem is that you get to see the conditional use and they don't unless there's an appeal. I, I really, I don't know honestly where where they're coming from because certainly you have control. And my last comment is we're talking specifically about C2. And it's not just the impact of the pandemic on retail, but as you know, with online shopping, there's been a, there's been a seismic shift in America on commercial retail. 
we have C2 all over this county, not just in the US 19 area, but particularly West County. We have C2 in less than A locations. We're going to have trouble for the next 10 years and possibly forever repurposing and filling all the C2 areas we have, even at good locations, much less inferior locations. So conceptually, I question why would you take away one tool you have to possibly do a conditional use in an appropriate C2 location for multifamily? And if one of your conditions is, hey, it needs to be adjacent to other uses, it can't just be multifamily. Well, in the conditional use process, you certainly can impose that. And just because someone can apply for conditional use certainly doesn't mean that this board is obligated to approve it. Um, so that's why I'm confused by the whole effort and I just don't want to let it go without saying anything because I can I intend to continue speaking on this multifamily issue because I simply think that the the direction that some people are trying to go is just factually wrong. Uh, it's policy wrong. Uh, it's probably not legal, uh, but it certainly doesn't match the market demographics and the growth that Pasco County is having and will continue to have. So I, I, I think you need to hit the pause button. My only suggestion is hit the pause button, maybe think about those things uh, and, and, and then go from there. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Joe. Uh, Marcy Esberg. Thank you. Uh, so <clears throat> I'd like to take a moment to introduce myself. I've never had the opportunity to direct uh, to speak to you directly. Marcy Esberg, I'm the Director of Community Development for Pasco County. And I do want to uh, add to the comments specifically about this uh, in relation to affordable housing, which is what uh, we focus in as one of our core uh, portions of our mission here in community development. And I will tag on to the previous speaker and say that uh, Pasco is a very growing county. And <clears throat> perhaps because of the pandemic, because of just growth in, in Florida, uh, housing costs and rental costs are all uh, exorbitant. And right now, under uh, uh, the eviction moratorium and foreclosure moratorium, our markets have become extremely strained. Uh, houses are selling in a day. Uh, people are having a really hard time finding housing. I particularly doing a lot of work with the homeless and we have a housing surge going on and we're having difficult time finding rental housing for people that were paying uh, to get housing and get them out of homelessness. And so any tool that the county has in their toolbox to increase housing, increase supply of housing, increase supply of ho affordable housing is critical for our community. It's critical to create a balanced community. Uh, you know, in order to for our children to go to school, we need teachers, we need, um, we need clerical staff, we need custodians in our schools. Uh, those are all people that would fit under affordable housing. In order for you or I to go to a doctor or go to the hospital, we need nurses, we need lab techs, we need, again, custodians. All those people are in affordable housing. So many of the people that are in front of you or going to talk to you from our county government all qualify on, under affordable housing. So what we want to do as we grow is we want to grow smart. We want to grow equitably and uh, and to me uh, a tool in the toolbox of this uh, a building and uh, a mixed use mixed zone building is a best practice all around the country and it concerns me number one that the county would be going against what would be an urban land institute best practice or a best practice again all over the count country but we decide to go in another direction number one and number two it's critical for the county to always consider any changes in policy how it's going to affect 
affordable housing, either the amount of affordable housing or the cost of affordable housing. So I, I just want you to consider that part as well, because uh, because our county, again, is growing. The need has exacer exacerbated just in the two and a half years that I've been here. And to put a policy like this into practice into in place would only exacerbate it even more. Thank you for your time. Thank you. I appreciate your input. Um, so, David, are you saying that uh, if it's just a strict rezoning that we don't have the flexibility to, or the county doesn't have the flexibility to impose certain uh, requirements? So, if it is, well, okay, it depends how it comes to you. If it comes to you as an MPUD and some departments do come to you as an MPD and, and in those instances you do have the ability to impose conditions. For a straight rezoning, yes, you would not have the ability to impose conditions. However, as noted from today's item and other items, staff basically finds a way to do that through a deed restriction. So if they have specific concerns about a straight rezoning, they usually will ask the applicant to enter into a deed restriction that imposes additional restrictions. So while it's not a condition, it does effectively act like a condition, if that makes sense. Uh, yeah. The big difference is that it's not imposed by the planning commission or the board. It's really volunteered by the applicant to get an approval. Yes, I understand. Okay. All right, uh, well. Does and anybody have any questions about it? Just to clarify, this is Jamie Jarrett again. Just to clarify, conditional uses also go to the board, correct? We only approve special exceptions. That's correct. Yeah, conditional uses and, and rezonings go to the Planning Commission and the board. Oh. Mr. Chair, if, if I could, I mean, I, I, re listening to all this and, and you know, agreeing with what Jamie's saying about that, I think the big issue here is the unintended consequences of possibly pushing something like this through so quickly because it, it seems like it is being in, you know i don't know that i'm in a position today you know well enough educated to be able to to really understand that those unintended consequences and what that might result in so um i, I appreciate the feedback of miss well and mr two they're on the front lines of doing a lot and miss miss asperg I, I think they're they're very well taken so i I just feel the unintended consequences is something we really need to <clears throat> consider moving on this. Okay, so what are you recommending? Excuse me, are you talking about affordable housing or the C2 zoning that we are talking about? Yeah, I'm talking about the unintended consequences of actually proving this ordinance as it's, <coughs> as it's written. Well, can I just add one comment to that? So. If your concern is affordable housing, I'm not sure what your concern is, but if your concern is affordable housing, that could be remedied by still, instead of removing all multifamily for, as a conditional use, you could change it to say that only affordable multifamily is a conditional use in C2. In other words, if that was your only concern, that's an easy remedy. You would just, instead of removing it, you would change what's allowed to be affordable multifamily as opposed to all multifamily. But I don't know if that's your only concern. Yeah, I, I think my my only concern was why would you want to, you know, limit yourself in terms of what, what you could do and to uh, restrict the development in a way that you thought would be beneficial to the to the community if that's if that's the result of this particular motion. If if maybe a, that isn't the result, and that's what I'm looking for clarification for. If the if the commissioners, county commissioners, can can do that and we don't have to do it and you know, that's fine with me i just want to make sure that I, I just think it's better to have a tool that where you can you know fine tune some of these things rather than just come in with a meat cleaver and say yes or no and and i i did watch the vast majority of the, the board workshop and i i do hear their concerns i know there are concerns and it seems like there's quite an abundance of, of multifamily in certain sections of the county. Um, and I, I, I don't disagree with that. However, to take something completely away just with a broad stroke of a paintbrush, 
when even if people do apply for a conditional use, it still has to go to them. They still have the option to deny the request for the conditional use. So that's why I, I personally, I'm, I'm just, I'm against totally removing it as a potential conditional use under the C2. Okay. Well, then we have a, a couple of options. Uh, if we, we have an option to approve it, we have an option to deny it. Deny it. We have, also have an well, option do, to continue it. And can I just add, add one more statement? Technically, on this item, you're acting as the LPA, which means you have to make a recommendation about whether it's inconsistent or consistent with the comprehensive plan. So you certainly could make a recommendation to find it inconsistent with a comprehensive plan, but it's strict. It's not technically a approval or denial. It's a, is it or is it not consistent with the comp plan? Okay. Or I guess we can, could continue it until we have more information if we wanted to. So it's either that, consistent, consistent or continue. That, that's, an, that's an option too. I, that it's the planning commission. But I'll let, I'll let Denise and Terry speak to the urgency to this matter as far as the board's concerned. Well, Terry, Denise, what comments do you have? Yes, Mr. Chairman, this is Terry Pitos, Planning and Development. Uh, the Board of County Commissioners directed the Planning and Development Department to bring forward this question um, at the next available, I believe at the next available Board of County Commissioners um, meeting which meant that we needed to take it through the process, which is why the item is on this agenda. However, they didn't necessarily specify, and David, maybe you can correct me if I'm wrong, as my memory serves me correctly. Um, if, if it wasn't on the March 23, um, they would probably most likely expect it in early April. I don't recall the board giving a specific time frame for this. Um, I don't know if you've had private discussions with the county administrator about it, but um, it, I, my, my only question to you, Terry, was if your timing's a concern, my recommendation would be that the planning commission just send it forward with a recommendation to find it inconsistent with a comp comprehensive plan. If you don't think timing's a concern, then we can continue it. But you would know the timing better than I would. Denise, any comments? Yeah, from my from my recollection, I was at that Board of County Commissioners meeting on February 9th. Um, basically, what was what was offered to the board is that that is a simple thing to do. It's a standalone amendment. It could be done fairly quickly. Um, I'm almost certain that there was at some point we said that it could probably happen within the next 60 to 90 days. Um, but we didn't, we didn't state exactly what date it would happen, but yes, there was a, a sense of, um, and I'm going to use this term, but it's, I don't think this is the real word urgency or some, some form of urgency. So it was important that it get done, uh, fairly quickly. Okay. So you say 60 to 90 days. So if we continued it until the next meeting, we'd be all right then. Or we can, I, I would, some, I would say members, so, yeah. Some of the members obviously have questions about it. And, and you know, I don't think, I think we need to, I think we need to understand um, to the plan, to the local planning agency, the planning commission, I think we need to understand what we need to show you um, to address your concerns or your questions. Because I know we can continue it potentially to the 25th, which is the next planning commission, local planning agency meeting at 1.30 in Newport Ritchie. Uh, but I think we also need to um, we need to show you what exactly you're look you're looking for in terms of what can answer some of your questions. I guess what your the questions are. Way that, the easiest way to say that is the questions that were raised by Mr. Tu and Mrs. Wilhite yeah, are the questions that we have. You know, are there unintended consequences that are they taking away tools that we should actually be be using in the future that can benefit the county? Uh, are we, is this a knee jerk reaction to something that we don't like? Um, we did, we, I don't think any of us have any objection to, to 
approving it if it's a tool that we've thought this thing through. We don't want to just uh, make a, you know, just overreact, in other words, without thinking of what we're doing. Okay. So, Mr. Uh, Chair, yeah, can I just make a comment there? So, it kind of depends on what you consider an unintended consequence because I think our board does intend to limit multifamily. <laughs> I mean, that is an intended consequence of the Board of County Commissioners. Now, one might argue that they didn't intend to, to limit affordable multifamily, and that might be an unintended consequence, and possibly even, you know, vertically integrated multifamily. Um, but if, if those are the potential unintended consequences, those can be fixed by changing the code to allow those two types of multifamily, but still making all other multifamily not a conditional use in C2. So that's not a data inch issue. That's a, we can fix the amendment to, to allow those to occur. But mm -hmm. other than affordable housing and possibly mixed use multifamily, I'm not sure that there are any other unintended consequences. I think the board, in my opinion, from hearing the conversation does want to limit what I'll call standard multifamily development in the commercial district. Yeah, I, I know that. Uh, does it also limit our uh, ability to control landscape and things like that, that we buffer zones and does it take us out of that? Mr. Chairman, I think the, uh, if you remove the conditional use from C2, it would then cause a rezoning action to get the multifamily and at that point you would not be able to condition outright um, but as as the uh, county attorney noted um, there's the opportunity or the option to deed restrict at those at those situations but uh, it's not as forceful as mandating a condition via conditional use so we're talking about what's happening within the c2 and the ability to condition within the C2. And if we take that away, then we got to go to other zoning districts and deal with the rezoning process and, and the limitations of that. And I would add to what Terry said is you, this, the planning commission has approved a number of rezonings to multifamily districts, MF1, MF2, MF3 with deed restrictions. And specifically, some of them have limited the multifamily to townhomes as opposed to apartments. So there is a history of, of approving multifamily rezonings with deed restrictions. You've done it before is my point. Okay. All right. I mean, again, my, my concern is not as much, I mean, unintended consequences, yes, is one concern, but also I, I don't, I mean, just the generic and, and broad stroke of eliminating the conditional use in the commercial zoning. I mean, that frankly, there, in my opinion, there's areas that are commercially zoned in this county that multifamily makes sense on. I mean, there's stuff, parts of the 19 corridor that there's probably way more commercial than will ever be used. And, um, I mean, there, there was the redevelopment at the mall, for example. Um, so I, I, I mean, I don't know what what is the criteria for um, stating it's inconsistent with the comp plan. So you're saying basically you take some of this excess property in on Highway 19, basically in Newport Ritchie. That's basically a, a large building, no longer used, and converted into apartments or housing or something. No, what, what I'm saying is, is that I think there's a lot more commercial out there in light of what's going on in the commercial market these days. There's a lot more commercially zoned property out there than there ever is going to be demand for commercial uses. And then to follow up with that comment then is to convert it into residential property or apartments? No, I'm, I'm saying you, you leave the property owner the option for a conditional use. Look, the board still has the right to deny a conditional use. Yeah, but he could do that and that would be a use of property then, correct? A, a good function. Correct. Yeah. And alleviates the uh, housing crisis for, uh, for income groups or various uses. That's what I'm, to, I'm to answer, yeah, to answer Mr. Girardi's question directly, if you want to find it consistent with the comp plan, you would have to identify policies in the comp plan that this act is consistent with. Um, I'm not sure staff's going to be able to help you with that. 
because they've been charged <laughs> to bring this forward. So you'd either be on your own or maybe Mr. Tu or Miss Wilhite could help you out with that. But um, yeah, I mean, David, this is Joel. If if the commission sees fit to continue it, if if the county attorney's office is going to abandon the planning commission, um, I'll be glad to provide those policies because clearly <laughs> it's inconsistent with affordable housing. It's inconsistent with the urban service area and the promotion of density. I can give you a litany of policies that it's inconsistent with, uh, and I'm happy to uh, help the planning commission in this regard. I'm not saying that I'm abandoning the planning commission to be clear. I do serve a, I do serve a higher master. So I know I would just give me a hard time. I, I get it. And I, I'm not, con I'm not conceding yet that there are three votes on that county commission to restrict uh, apartments in the county. Uh, yeah. Well, I know David and I know he would never abandon us. So I'm good there. <laughs> Denise, from a perspective of education, I think, you know, the place to start, and I kind of started this, and I saw a couple of my colleagues write it down, but is it the board workshop, the industry expert presentation that was referenced? Um, you know, if we were to continue it, it'd be for more for me to educate myself on the issue, and I think that would be a good place to good place to start. So my my vote would be to, to continue this. So is that a motion? If you would like me to make it a decision, yeah, I'll uh, uh, move to continue this item to, um, uh, let's see, we, we discussed Are we doing April. March 25th or April 1st? April 1st, that's April 1st. at work. That's, I think that was Brad's guidance, so yeah, that. Miss Jamie Girardi, I'll second. Okay, any further discussion on the motion? All in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. Jamie Girardi. Aye. Peter Hansel. Aye. Roberto Size. Aye. Christopher Pohl. Aye. Chris Williams. I think I vote on this. Um, oh, come on. <laughs> I like that. Everybody's working down there. Like... <laughs> okay. And Chairman Charles Gray. Aye. Hey, that was the last item on your agenda. Okay, thank you. We have a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Chris Poole. Second. Chris All in favor? Aye. Aye. And, Aye. and thank you, all the staff, for all your help. Uh, yeah, we had a lot of questions on this one. And Denise, I'll tell you, you're, you're a real soldier. You're a warrior showing up after all that pain you were in. You know. So, Smile. We appreciate you. Yeah, well, it's nice to see you all, and I wish I could be there, but, you know, maybe next time. I'm not sure. We'll see. Okay, well, we hope so. That's right. Yeah. Thanks, David. I know you're with us. I would never expect you to leave us. I'm always with you all, <laughs> even if I'm not there in person. That's right. <laughs> okay, thank you, everybody. All right, see you next time. Thank, thank you. you. Okay. Have a good weekend. Thank you. Well